the last few months, I've been doing a fortnightly airport chaplaincy shift at Launceston Airport. So I've spoken to you in the past a little bit about what happens at Hobart Airport and chaplaincy, but I've also started a chaplaincy service at Launceston Airport. And that started by me doing fortnightly shifts, starting about three months ago. So every fortnight I've been driving to Launceston Airport, which door to door from my house to there is a two hour drive. So I've had time to think, and reflect, and time to pray, with my eyes open in this case, <laughs> and uh, time to listen to podcasts, and I enjoy driving, so it hasn't been a burden. But on one trip seven or eight weeks ago, I gave some thought to how a two-hour drive to Launceston relates to the journey of life. What learnings are there for a drive to Launceston? What can I learn during today's drive, I thought, that could be useful as I do life, and specifically as we move as a local church into the new year. So this message is called Learnings from a Drive to Launceston Airport. The Bible is, of course, full of learnings. And I'm going to link my learnings from the drive to Launceston with learnings from the book of Philippians. This book was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. And it was written to the church in a place called Philippi. Now there's a variety of reasons why Paul wrote this particular book to this particular church, or this letter to the church, but it was mainly to thank them for a gift that they had given to Paul. But he also took the opportunity to encourage them to stand firm in the face of persecution, and he encouraged them to live in unity with one another. There are four chapters in the book, and the four key messages are chapter 1. Jesus is our message. Verse 18 says, The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. The message from chapter 2 is that Jesus is our example. Verse 5 says, The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus Christ had. And it goes on to talk about his humility and making himself a servant. Chapter 3, Jesus is our goal. Verse 14, they run straight toward the goal to win the prize that God's heavenly call offers in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our goal. And lastly, chapter 4, Jesus is our sufficiency. Verse 13 says, I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. So the first thing I learned on the drive to Monsesson is that seasons come and go. It was sunny when I started my drive to Monsesson. I left just after dawn, the sun was up, there were virtually no clouds in the sky. And as I drove to Monsesson, it got cloudier and cloudier. By the time I arrived at Monsesson Airport, it was raining. Now this is not a comment about some kind of north <laughs> South divide or rivalry. Uh, nothing to do with that. It's not any comment about whether the weather is better in Hobart or not. Because by the time I drove home that afternoon, it was raining in Hobart as well. But the point is that there are seasons in life. There are sunny days and there are rainy days. There are enjoyable days and there are difficult days. As we travel through 2021, the physical seasons will change. We'll have a few warm days over the summer, we'll move on into winter, and then through into the new life of spring. The warm days come and go. The snow on the mountain will come and go. There'll be hot days, there'll be cold days. And even in one day, like the day I drove to Launceston, it can be sunny in the morning and raining in the afternoon. In life, there are good times and bad times. And there are just different times. We can look ahead through 2021 and say we will have good times and we will have difficult times. But we can also look across the years or decades of a lifetime and say there are seasons in life. The person you are and the responsibilities and the influence that you have when you are 15 are very different to when you are 50. I started a new Bible study on the Bible app the other day and it's called Seven questions that rattle in the minds of most men. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're the women laugh. 
seven questions that rattle in the minds of most men. And the devotional reading on the first day including, included a list of the five seasons of a man's life. And I've seen similar lists to this by other people as well, but this particular one says that ages zero to twenty is called the foundation. And it's the time when you are influenced by parents and peers and pivotal circumstances that happen in your life. Ages 20 to 30 is called preparation, a time when you're gathering education and experiences and making initial choices about love and lifestyle. Ages 30 to 40 is called initiation. Sounds a bit painful, but it's where you learn your strengths and weaknesses as you expand responsibilities at home, at work or in the community. Ages 40 to 60 is domination, where you apply yourself toward accomplishing God's assignment for you. Ages 60 plus is consolidation, when you narrow in your legacy and resolve her relationships. So we need to acknowledge the fact that there are seasons, and we need to be prepared for difficult days by choosing the four they before us to remain true and steadfast to the call of God on our lives. And God remains with us every step of the journey. I drive to Launceston to be the airport chaplain, and chaplaincy in any setting is known as a ministry of presence. It's about being there. A lot of the role is just about turning up over and over again. It's about being there. And this reflects the fact that God's presence is always with us. I heard the senior police chaplain in the Victoria Police speak, I was going to say last year, it was a year before now, um, in 2019 at a conference, and he talked about his long experience as a police chaplain and said that it's 95% just being there and 5% actually attending to a significant need. But if you're not there for the 95%, you don't get invited to partake or to participate, I mean, in the 5% when there is a significant need. It's about being there. And this being there reflects the fact that God does that with us. He's always there. Always with us. Whatever we encounter in the way of difficult times or rainy days, the Holy Spirit strengthens and sustains us. Philippians 1.6 says that, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion of the day of Jesus Christ. The journey is the journey. There's good days and bad days. The journey is the journey. The good times and the bad times are part of the journey. Times that we go through. Psalm 23 talks about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Yes, there's a way through the valley, but you can't always see that way through when you are in the valley. It can be a dark place, the valley of darkness. But God is with you in the dark times. The Hebrew word used there for through probably has a stronger connotation about being in than it does about being through. So you're in the valley of darkness, the shadow of the valley of darkness, but God is there with you. That's the point. Yes, God might take you through eventually, but when you're in there, God's with you. God is with you every step of the way. We are encouraged to know there's a way through, but also we need to acknowledge the value of being in the hard times. Many people's testimony is that they experience God most in their hard times, in their difficult times. As we read earlier from Philippians 4.13, God gives, God gives us strength to face all conditions. Secondly, the Bible study I mentioned a couple of minutes ago is called Seven Things That Rattle in the Mind. And that reminds me of this second point called Alter Course for the New. Because as I was driving along, there was a rattle somewhere at the front of my car. Somewhere under the dash or somewhere around the steering wheel with all the knobs and the buttons and the levers and everything else. So I started, as I'm driving along, I started feeling around and trying to hold something that would stop rattling so I knew what, where the rattle was and we could maybe fix it later on. So I'm doing that and I accidentally knocked the cruise control lever off. 
So I got on cruise control, 110, of course, no more than that. And I knocked it off, so my car immediately slowed down. I was on a slight bend, and because I slowed down, I went slightly off course and hit that uh, rumble strip or ripple strip along the side of the road. So they are placed as a warning device to road users, and for those who aren't drivers and haven't noticed this before, if you're on a highway and you veer off a little bit to the side of the road, you hit the rumble strip and it makes an obnoxious sound and it kind of jerks you back into reality, the fact that you're going off course a little bit. And they have them all over the world, these rumble strips or ripple strips, and they're there to keep you safe, but in my case, I wouldn't have heard the rumble strip if I hadn't gone off course. And there's a lot of value in slowing down and heading in a different direction sometimes. Because we open up the possibility of experiencing something new. We alter course for the new. There's value in changing course. However, if we maintain the status quo, going the same pace and doing the same things over and over, then there's no room for new experiences. And their lives will perhaps be just a shadow of what they could be. Changing pace and building into our lives time for reflection helps us to process decisions and to think outside of the square. Now these rumble strips are all over the planet pretty much, but someone who obviously had some time for reflective thinking realised that different rumble strips have a different frequency or produce a different frequency of sound. And you can therefore design a rumble strip or some material on a road surface that will play you a tune while you drive over it. <laughs> so there's a few of those around the world, and here's one now on this spot. So the pandemic last year, and ongoing, gave many people a different perspective on life over this last year or so, as it forced people into a new routine and to move at a different pace. I know people who changed their job. They didn't lose their job because of the pandemic. But they thought, actually, this working from home and spending more time with the family has made me realise that I haven't been spending enough time with my family, and they quit their job and took a bank up, took a different job, and they're spending more time at home with their family. So it gave people a different perspective on life. And many people remarked in the last few days about how bad 2020 was and the hope for a better 2021. And I know it's extremely difficult for many people and it still is now, but there are seasons in life. Don't write 2020 off as a year from hell and develop a negative attitude to that period of your life. Oh, Time is a gift from God. Gail and I spent our honeymoon in Africa, it was this time of the year, and we had a dinner with some African people in Kenya and on New Year's Eve, and they were all, they prayed fervently in thanks that they had lived through another year. And the life expectancy of that nation was perhaps 30 or 40 years less than it is here. So they were there in their mid-20s and 30s, and they are thankful that they got through another year. And we've got to take it for granted, but 2020 was a gift from God. Mm, yep. It was time given by God to us to spend on planet Earth. So don't develop a negative attitude towards it. We've all had experiences in the last year that we wouldn't have had without the pandemic. We've altered course for the new. It was forced upon us, but we altered course and experienced something new. Consider this question from psychologist and author Kelly Flanagan, who said, If this crisis is inviting you to grow as a person and you accepted the invitation, what would we be celebrating about your growth when the pandemic is over? I'll read it again. 
If this crisis is inviting you to grow as a person and you accepted the invitation, what would we be celebrating about your growth when the pandemic is over? Many people have been complaining about 2020 over the last few days as we celebrated the new year, but I was impressed with people who bucked the trend on social media and gave thanks for a year of growth and learning. Our own Michelle Richardson, who was one, I'm embarrassed now, who said 2020 was a successful year and she was absolutely blessed by the opportunities afforded her this year. She gave some more details around what she had done during the year. And it was a breath of fresh air to read a comment like that amongst all the doom and gloom and how bad 2020 was. That's the attitude we need to have when we have an opportunity to grow. And we get to choose our attitude. We're looking at a, a little at the book of Philippians today. And Paul wrote in 1.12, And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. He was having a bit of a 2020 year himself. He was writing from prison. And he says, it's okay. All the bad things that have happened have actually been good for the spread of the gospel of Jesus. We all get to choose our attitude. So make a choice today to alter course to experience something new. Maybe you need to go for a walk or a run a bike ride, or even driving home a different way than you normally go, to get a different perspective. Or maybe it's not about slowing down to alter course, but maybe you need to pick up the pace. Maybe you're going too slow already. And pick up the pace and spend some time exploring a new opportunity. And be encouraged to build time with God into that space. Sit with God. Reflect with God. There's great value in reflective time. If we just go from this thing to that thing to the next thing and just go on and on and on and never create into our world some time and some space to think and to bounce ideas around our mind, then we're missing out. We're just stuck in this rut. We need to alter course for a new experience. My third learning from the drive was to connect with people. For part of my drive, I listened to some ABC radio and they played an interview with a coordinator of a board games group in the Melbourne suburb of Ringwood. And Melbourne was in lockdown at that stage and so the, the interview was all about how this group had moved online and they're playing board games with each other online. And Towards the end of the interview, the coordinator of the board game group said, if you ever see us meeting, and he was talking about in the future when they can meet physically together again, if you ever see us meeting, don't see a board game group. We are a people group. And I loved that. He was saying they shared a common interest in playing and enjoying board games, but the group, for him as a coordinator, was really about getting people together. It was about him connecting with other people. It was about relationship. It was about friendship. It was a people group, not a board game group. In the traditional church calendar, today is known as Epiphany. And on this day we remember the visit of the Magi to Jesus. And we also remember the baptism of Jesus by John. Now these events are both multifaceted, but a common theme is the fact that Jesus came for all people, not just for the Jews. The Jews were waiting for a Messiah, and most of them mistakenly thought that it was just the Messiah was just for them. But the visit of the Magi showed early on in Jesus' life that he was there for all people, because the Magi came from a faraway land. And later in life, Jesus was baptised in the river Jordan by his cousin John. Baptism is symbolic of a decision we have made to, in a sense, die to our old way of life and to live for Jesus. 
In baptism, we are lowered down into the water to signify the cleansing we've experienced from Jesus and then raised again to the new life that we have in him. And importantly for us today, it's a visible demonstration to those around us that we are a follower of Jesus. We don't follow Jesus alone, we do it in community. And the closer we get to Jesus, and the more like Jesus we become, the more we will want to be with people and share the good news about him with those around us. As I mentioned earlier, we're having a baptismal service next Sunday, about 12.30 at Rachel's Beach. And if you're a follower of Jesus and never been baptised, maybe there's something you can do to alter the course and try something new. And make conscious decisions this year to connect with other people. I preached to you on the 1st of March last year, before the pandemic really got going here, and before we had any sort of lockdown, before our services were cancelled, I preached here on the importance of connecting with others to prepare for times of crisis. <laughs> and I made the point, point that friends and supports don't necessarily just appear when we go through a tough time. They don't come out of nowhere, but they are there because we've developed those relationships over time. And so when we have a tough time, we've already got connection and supports around us. I didn't realise at that stage that it was a tough time for everybody. The whole community was going into lockdown and becoming isolated. But I encourage you on that day to reach out to someone, to reach out to, keep, to people in your community, to reach out to friends, to reacquaint yourself with some people you haven't spoken to for a while, and to do life with other people, because that is important when things get tough. In my world of supplying pastoral care volunteers into evacuation centres, I hear a lot about resilience and the need for individuals and communities to increase their resilience. Resilience isn't bouncing back, it's bouncing forward. It's taking a difficult situation and not trying to get back to where we were after the situation, but using that situation to bounce forward into something new. And our three points today will increase your resilience. They help you on your journey. Go the worship team back, please. Thank you. To be resilient, you need to be prepared. You don't have to go looking for a bad day. But when they come, they don't need to take you out. Seasons come and go. If you feel like you're caught in a rut, then alter course and experience something new. Spend time with Jesus and spend time with people. Connect with others. Take a step outside your normal or usual group and meet someone new. People are fascinating and interesting. So get out there and get connected.